that's what prophets do. Prophets announce the direction of the Lord. In every apostolic ministry, a prophet should fall into our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. Now you see, I'm getting a little older. I have to crank up. <laughs> Don't let me lose you in the first 10 minutes. It's good to be here today. I'm, I'm really very thankful for Pastor Kevin and uh, for their, his reception, his, he and his wife's reception to my wife and myself. We believe that it was a divine appointment. God set it up, and I believe that it's increasing in its intensity in the spirit. Yesterday was an indication of that. Every time that I've stood before you at his introduction, I'm standing under the anointing that he carries. And I believe you're receiving by that multiplied, compounded anointing. Amen? Amen. A lot of people don't understand anointings. You receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. You receive the prophet's reward. <clears throat> Apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers are all gifts of God to you gifts and you wonder sometimes why you sit there and say well I don't feel like I'm being fed well you haven't received the gift you need to receive the gift and say God use that man that woman beyond their ability <clears throat> let your anointing flow let the anointing teach us today amen? amen so I hope you'll do that in your hearts today as I stand before you because I'm telling you the older you get in ministry the less you feel capable of delivering what God said to, to deliver. Now, I don't know that everybody would say that, but that's what's happened to me. I responded to the, my first time to the Lord 62 years ago at the age of eight, sitting next to my grandmama Denham. Thank God for grandmamas. Amen. I was in old Robert's crusade, 10,000 people in that tent in Florence, South Carolina. At the invitation of the big old organ, I got up and nobody knew it went down to that altar. Stood there as an eight-year-old child, didn't know what in the world I was doing. I looked to the left and there was a healing tent. I was observing everything. I was taking it all in. But thank God I was with my grandmama that night. She took a grandbaby and I was a grandbaby, eight years old. It wasn't until 10 years later I gave my life to the Lord solidly and completely. 18. Two weeks later I was in Bible college. From the time I gave my life to the Lord, August 17th, I was in Bible school, September 1st. So I said, well, isn't that wonderful? No, it wasn't, it wasn't wonderful. <laughs> Stayed five years there in that school, I crammed four into five. Because <laughs> I never intended to go to Bible school, never intended to go to college, really. I had other plans. But what happened during that period of time was they thought I could preach. And so they put me in pastoring churches. You know what the Bible says about that? Don't lay hands on a novice. I was a novice as green as a gourd. You know what that'll, what'll do to a novice? It'll make him proud. And the Bible says, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, Timothy he said, don't lay hands on a novice because you'll fall into the snare of the enemy, the pride of the enemy. And it took about 14, 15 years later when I fell into that, which was about 28 years ago when I hit the proverbial zero factor. I ran into who I was. And when I looked at who I was, I didn't like myself. Anybody had to identify with that? Yeah. <clears throat> but the God in His mercy met me at the point of my need and gave me a revival 28 years ago that continues to this day. And I want to tell you that because in the process of what was happening there without giving all the details, I ran into this word of the Lord by a man named Watchman Nee. Anybody remember hearing my Watchman Nee? I consider him my first teaching apostle. And I heard the word of the Lord concerning the city church 46 years ago. And that seed was planted in my soul. That word took hold of me. And by the grace of God, since that time, I've been desiring and seeking to take hold of it. 
And I can tell you to this day, 46 years later, I'm still learning things about the city church. The first thing I know is this, not too many people know about the city church. Not too many people hear about it. But we're gonna talk about it a little bit this morning. Pastors encourage me to do this. But I can tell you this, let me say up front, the city church is not an organization. It's not an institution. You can't organize it and you can't institutionalize it. But you can receive it in the spirit and I'm telling you that when you receive the revelation of the, spirit, of the city church, something comes into your house. <clears throat> the right spirit comes into your house. The invitations you give to other people to come to your house, it's a different invitation. Something happens. You know what happens? Jesus begins to build his church. As a young pastor, I went to a lot of church conferences where we had growth Seminars. You remember those? You still go to some of those, Kev? Mm -hmm. Pastor Kevin, excuse me. I, I, at 70 years old, I'm conferenced out. <laughs> Not that I can't learn anything else. It's just that I'm just conferenced out. I'm burnt out on conferences. Because I understand in my heart at this age of 70, 52 years later from the time I made my decision solid, 62 years later from the time of being accosted, that the Lord is making me the message, not giving me a message. You know that's what will happen to you? <clears throat> Pastor Kevin is becoming the message that God gave him. He's not just preaching a message. And I heard Pastor Mike saying some things about you yesterday, and they're true, they're absolutely true. But that's the joy of being able to, stick, to be under a ministry, a five-fold ministry that God set in place you're sitting under the man who's the message. That, that's not an exaltation of the man, that's just the, back, to the, back to the same point. Receive a prophet in the name of the prophet that God appointed, the gift, and you will receive the gift that prophet has in him. That's what we were ha was happening this morning. I've received, I've received Pastor Kevin as the prophetic anointing that he, that he has. When he prophesies to me, I listen because I'm listening for the Word of God, amen? amen? So anyhow, I wanted to give you an overview of where I've come from. Sometimes when people stand up in front of me, I like to say, who are you? <laughs> where are you from and what in the world are you doing here? But we're beginning to feel more and more like family, really, I want you to know that. You know, I, I've been so refreshed by being here. I, I needed a refreshing and I still need refreshing. When I left yesterday, I told, I told my wife and her sister, I said, I feel like I've been overly stimulated. <laughs> when, you, when you're dealing with trying to overcome Parkinson's, it's, so, it's easy to get overly, overly stimulated. You deal with anxiety and things like that that have nothing to do with your thinking. It has everything to do with your, what's happening with your body. But it was a good overstimulation yesterday. I mean, I left rejoicing. We just had a wonderful time. Sorry you missed it. But yesterday, I gave a little exhortation concerning the city church. And I wanted to try to pick up on that, even though maybe you were not there. I keep trying to drop little nuggets. By the way, I heard a word about the parable of the sower this morning. I never thought about this, Pastor. But the parable of the sower, what does he sow? Seed. seed. What is the seed? Word. This morning I heard the Lord say, but it's a particular seed. And so you're sowing a seed that's a particular seed. I'm sowing this morning a seed that is a particular seed and it will fall on the different types of ground, of soil, of hearts. And so that's what I believe is gonna to happen today. Some of you are gonna rejoice, some of you are gonna say, what was that? <laughs> Amen? Some will rejoice, get all excited about it and forget it by next week. So what did the preacher preach last week? I don't know, but it felt good. <laughs> So anyhow, so we're gonna talk about the city church. And, I, and yesterday I mentioned this, I mentioned it again today. As best I can count in the scriptures, there are 12 city churches mentioned in particular. How many of you are familiar with the seven churches of Revelation? Yes. <clears throat> the seven churches of Revelation are city churches. And when Jesus spoke to these churches, he said, 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear <clears throat> what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to the cities. Let me make this clear to us this morning, and I'm not going to be critical. I'm just trying to be informational. There is no other authority in church authority but the city. That's as far as it goes. Cities must communicate with cities in order to hear what God is saying. There's no associational headquarters for church government. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not accusing or criticizing of that. Somebody one time prophesied denominations are an abomination. And I said, no, that's not true. Thank God for denominations. God's helped use denominations to preserve our truth that we are able to receive today. So I'm not seeking to be critical, but I'm seeking to be very pointed and biblical. You can't go beyond the city for the government of God. So you must, if you want to find out the government of God, you must become acquainted with the city church. Who has God sent to the city? What, pro, what, what apostles, what prophets, what evangelists, what pastors, what teachers has God sent to the city? And what kind of spirit do they have? What kind of attitude do they have concerning the city church? I said it, I want to keep saying this. The city church is a spirit. And you can be of the right spirit or you can be of the wrong spirit. Now let me say this as well. Spirit equals atmosphere. I can walk into a room and tell if there's a right spirit there. Because after all these years, I have the discerning ability to do that by, by the Lord. I, I used to be critical of it, but now, now it saddens me. And that's why I know it's from God, because it saddens me. I used to be critical, and that's because I was in my pride and still trying to overcome pride. But the, you, you're, this house carries a spirit, and by and large, it's the spirit of this pastor and his wife. Actually, this is the house of Priscilla and Aquila. Have you read about that one? The church that was in their house. This auditorium used to be the auditorium and living room of Pastor Fred and Pastor Jan. And the spirit that was here was, was, was our spirit. Some of you look like you might be concerned about that. <laughs> See, that's how spirit works. When, you, when I go into your house, I'm going to discern your spirit. And if the spirit of peace is there, it will remain. But if it's not, it'll go back with me. That's what Jesus said. <clears throat> so this, 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 has, this has connections that are not understood, that if understood correctly, we would begin to be <clears throat> a powerful force in our city. See, Jesus, everybody know he said, I'll build my church. The ministry has been too busy trying to build the church. Our message is to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' ministry is to build the church. Whenever we find that that's happening correctly, things can happen. We no longer will be concerned about how many, we'll be concerned about what's going on with what's the process. Are we of the right spirit? These are the kind of things. See, if we, don't, if we don't understand that the Lord's building the house, then we can keep a wrong spirit and go about church business as usual, gather a crowd together, and make no real progress for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is, according to Romans 14, 17, righteousness, peace, joy, in the Holy Ghost. You know, we Pentecostals like that. <laughs> Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Mike said it yesterday, and I'm in total agreement. We're not trying to get the unity. We've got it, and we're commanded to keep it. But in order for us to get to that place, we've got to, the Lord's got to convert us. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but... We need to be converted. Remember when Jesus said, he said, except you be converted and become as little children, you'll not enter the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom, we, we, in this context, we need to consider the kingdom of God is not out yonder. The kingdom of God is present. 
The kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God has come, and the kingdom of God is coming. And so when we get that in context, then we understand that our business is to go forth preaching the kingdom of God. Not preaching church growth, preaching the kingdom of God. And Jesus, you build your church. I'm, gonna, I'm getting on board with your kingdom because I believe that the church is as big as the city. The, the city limits doesn't define the city church. It's the spirit of the city that defines the spirit church, of the city church. Now this is the thing, I'm going to, I'm going to talk scripture. I've been really talking scripture now, but some are concerned that I not, haven't read the scripture yet. Listen, you, you'll be glad to know over a 14 year period, a while back in the beginning of my revival, I read four different translations 70 times through. You know, it was amazing what I learned after all the ministry I'd been in what you can learn by reading the Bible. <laughs> After I'd read 70 times through the scripture completely, because I read them about five or six times a year at the time, the Lord let me change my regimen and I just read it a different kind of way these days. But it's amazing what you, what the Lord will talk to you out of that word. He'll correct you and instruct you, rebuke you and reprove you. And sometimes he'll, he'll accommodate you too. He'll say, boy, that's all right, that's good, buddy. You see it. So anyhow, I'm just here to relax this morning. I, I tell you, I, I have a tendency when, when I stand under such great men of God, I, I, I get a little nervous. And I don't, I don't want to be nervous. I want to, I want to preach. I want to teach. Well, that was my introduction. <laughs> By the way, I'm so glad to have our son here and his wife, and they're expecting a baby. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, my wife is always here, and some of our sheep are here, and uh, we're excited. This is a new day. New day. This is my son and his wife's first baby together. Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? And you know when the baby's due? I'm saying it's on my birthday. Because <laughs> I think it was supposed to be somewhere around the 28th. But we can hold, hold off them until the 30th. I think we can work that into the schedule. Amen. Where do I want to begin? Well, somebody said begin at the beginning. I can't begin at the beginning. I'm telling you. This revelation of the city church is a growing entity within me. It's an organism. I heard somebody say something one time. I hope you can see this and identify this. When Kenneth Hagin opened up the Bible to read the Bible, the only thing he could see was the message of faith. And I thought to myself, I can understand that because every time I open up the Bible, basically all I see is the city church. It's just in my face all the time. I'm constantly meditating on that and have been for the past 46 years, especially over the past 28 years since my revival. Turn, turn to Matthew 16. Let's, let's do begin there because that's really, if I was going to be preaching like Brother Kevin preaches, Pastor Kevin, I'd be preaching from there in that beginning. Most of the folks who sat under my ministry for years know that I shoot from the hip. I'm sort of like a gunslinger. I may hit the target, I may not, you know. Forget about it, amen. Are you in Matthew 16? Yes, sir. We won't read the whole passage here. We'll just read these two verses. I want you to see this because this is critical in understanding the city church foundationally. Verse 18 says, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he said, on this rock, I will build my church. What was the rock? The revelation, and what was the what, further, and furthermore, it was the revelation of confession. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Your profession of the revelation, your agreement with the revelation. But skip down to 23 and look what happened right after the revelation. When Jesus was talking about going to the cross, Peter turned to him and said, you, you, 
You can't do that. You're not going to do that. But Jesus responded and said, get behind me, Satan. Somebody said, well, he wasn't talking to Peter. He sure was. Listen, the Lord knows when the devil's dealing with us, and he knows who to talk to about that with us. Amen? Aren't you glad you can say, get behind me, Satan? He said, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. That is the bottom line. Do you hear that? You're not concerned about the things of God. You're concerned about the things of men. I'm telling you, that is the message of church growth. Now, I'm not putting a blanket condemnation on church growth. We need to have things that we do and so forth. Y'all understand me? But the spirit of it is this. We're more concerned about what concerns man than we are concerned about what concerns God. And so when you begin this message and begin talking about the city church, you got to understand that God's concerned about what he's doing. And we said it while ago, sort of jokingly as we were talking, but most of the time the church gets something together, puts a program together and says, now God bless it, we pray. But Jesus, the pattern of how ministry is was, he said, I didn't come to say my own words. I didn't come to do my own works. Whatever I hear the Father saying, I say it. Whatever I see the Father doing, I do it. Somebody said, well, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Well, listen, Jesus didn't have his own thing going. How can you and Jesus have your own thing going? (laughs) Jesus has come to tell us, I'm going to build my church. And listen, I believe he's saying, I'm going to get it done whether you're with me or not. The Lord can save by many, and he can save by few. The Lord's never been impressed with a crowd. It was a crowd that said, crucify him. It was a crowd that was so dependent they needed somebody to defeat them. The Lord's always been impressed with a few who are committed, who've made the commitment for the long haul. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, it is a long haul. I said it before, before you, but when Pastor Kevin and Lady Tracy were coming to Charleston 20 years ago, I said, whoa, all right, my prophet. Glory to God. Surely he'll know what the Lord is saying. Well, he did, but it didn't register until 20 years later. <laughs> At his own admission. I'm not telling anything he hadn't said. But, so the Lord doesn't work on our timetable. Isn't that something to consider? Jesus is building his church. How will it look? I don't know exactly how it'll look physically, but I know how it will feel and be sent spiritually. And let me tell you what the greatest witness of the city church is. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet in chapter 13 of John, you remember that story? When he came to Peter, oh, Peter, he was just something. It reminds us of ourselves, doesn't it? What did Peter say? You'll never wash my feet. He thought that was holy. But what did Jesus respond? Anybody remember? If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. See, the apostle Paul said, we prophesy in part and we know in parts. Do you realize that you're a part? But you better understand that your part is a part of a whole and you better find the other parts and get connected because that's a part of what the city church is about, getting connected to parts. Because you'll never know wholeness or fulfillment until you begin to move in in that challenging place of offending brothers and insulting brothers and sisters and people you just don't like and rubbing up against them and saying, if I gotta do this, and the Lord said, yes, you do, you gotta do this. If you wanna find your life, you're gonna have to lose it. If you're gonna live, you're gonna have to die. If you're, going to, if you're going to run, you've got to lay down first. So Jesus said to the disciples there in John 13, he said, what I am doing to you, you don't know right now, but you'll know it later. Some of you thank God a little bit later when you think about this message, you'll say, now I understand what he was saying. 
You'll understand it later because it takes a while to sink in. Jesus, a little later in that passage, John 13, he said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. What was it that he said by this? You're, that you love one another. But then, but then again, here's what I want to remind you of. John the Apostle repeated it in John chapter, 1 John chapter 1. He said that new commandment, chapter 2 actually. The new commandment. You know what the new commandment was? The new commandment was not to love one another. But the new commandment was to love one another as I have loved you. Ha! Huh. Do you know who Jesus was washing the feet of? Peter, who would, be, who would deny him. Judas, who would betray him. And the other ten who would forsake him. That's whose feet he was washing. And you think you have some bad, bad feet to wash? <laughs> That's the story of the city church. We, our humanity wants to gather with people who are like us. We don't want to gather with people who are not like us. Now please let me give some, once again, disclaimers. We're not talking about an organization. We're not talking about institutionalizing. As a matter of fact, if you try to organize this thing, you'll fail miserably. But here's what I want to remind us of. When Jesus was going to the cross, listen, this is very important. When Jesus was going to the cross, he turned to Peter and said this to him. He said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. He's talking to you too, guys. But Jesus said to Peter, and he's saying to us, but I have prayed for you. He's our intercessor. What did he pray? He said, I have prayed that your faith fail not. And then he said this, which gets back to what we talked about earlier. And when you're converted, build up the brethren. And I heard Watchman Nee say that 46 years ago, Pastor. And I still believe it to this day. Only converted brethren can build up the brethren. There are many brethren standing in pulpits that have no ability to build up the brethren because there's a wrong spirit in the house and that wrong spirit is spread throughout the community because there's been no conversion to understand that Jesus is building his city church with many different types of members. And he's the one that is impressed with them. You may not be, but he is. Now, some of you looking at me strange. I'm gonna show you some scripture. I think I'm ready to go there now. <clears throat> Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So I know you, you, you people are a problem to me. You're Bible people. I better be preaching Bible when I come into legacy or I'll be in trouble. I want to show you these two little passages, actually about four or five verses, that again is the crux of understanding what the, what the revelation of the city church is about. And I'm telling you, when I show them to you, if you've never really considered them, it'll blow you away. It blew me away. First one, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, not 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. Listen to this. When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. Maybe he was talking about those parts that are parts. For there must be, somebody say must be. Does your Bible say that? There must be also factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Translated, the Lord said, there's got to be problems among you so that I can come and straighten them out in the right spirit. Rather than you kicking them out and disfellowshipping them or telling them they need to change their address of the church they belong to, Let's consider some things. Maybe, I, maybe I've sent them there to rub up against you just a little bit and irritate the tea out of you. I found out over the years the Lord would do that. I'm telling you, some people would show up at our place. My first associate pastor looked at me one day and he said, Brother, there's got to be some normal people somewhere in this city. <laughs> 
That was our introduction to the Charleston ministry. I want to say as a disclaimer, we finally got some people that seem pretty good, you know. But there must be factions. There must be that among us. Because the Lord's the only one that can straighten it out. Well, we know how to straighten that out, brother. Yeah, you, you got the wrong spirit. When is the last time you cried with people who got in their own way, who brought the same problems into your house that they had at the last house? One of the greatest things I ever learned in ministry was the best thing I could ever do is, tr- is talk to people where they came from and why they left from where they came from and encourage them to go back and apologize and repent concerning the thing that they'd been involved in that caused the division. Because I knew if that didn't happen, their division would come to our house. That same spirit would be in our house and we'd be dealing with it somewhere along the line. One of the greatest cases I ever had, Pastor, was when a young man came who was anxious for ministry. And I told him just that. He listened to what I said. He went back to the church. It was over in Somerville. He went back to the church and asked the pastor, because I said, go to the pastor and say to him, what do I need to do to make it right about my leaving? The pastor said, you need to stand before the congregation and tell them that. That young man did that. He went and stood before that congregation and confessed that he had the wrong attitude and the wrong spirit and asked for their forgiveness and the pastor blessed him. And he was a blessing in our house. That's how you do kingdom business, amen? Right spirit. Now look over at chapter 12 at verse 22. But did you notice when it said, when you come together as a church, let, let me put this in your, in your pipe for you to smoke this too. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which is the manner of some. He wasn't talking about this house or houses like it, even though you can apply it. But the application there was the city church. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, which is the manner of some already. They'll forsake it. How do I know that? Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 uses the same Greek word. And I, t- I showed Dr. Cottle this when I first found this, Brother Kevin. And Dr. Cottle shocked me. He said, I'd never seen that before. And I just I stumbled over it. But the same Greek word there is only used twice. And that was one, where one of the times it was used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And what was he talking about? The gathering there in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. He's talking about the gathering of the end time of all the church. So when Hebrews chapter, 11, chapter 10 verse 25 spoke about the assembling of together there, that word means gathering the whole church. But it, it was unpopular very quickly after the Lord's ascension. You know why? It's our human propensity. We want to be birds of a feather that flock together. We want to be alike. And, and we've turned that into a virtue. Well, brother, we all must, you know, two can only walk together except they be in agreement. Hallelujah. We don't want no division among us. Well, you're missing out on Jesus building his church. Our differences are our strength. Or is our strength, whichever is correct for you English teachers. I keep saying that, but people say that doesn't sound right. Well, listen here. Are you in chapter 12? Let's see, verse 22. Those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these are we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Now, I don't know if you can use your imagination, but your unpresentable parts, can you imagine? Everybody has unpresentable parts in this morning you don't want to present. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to be, I want to be graphic with understanding what he's really talking about. How many of you know that that unpresentable part is very necessary? I'm not just trying to be cute. I'm trying to bring home a point. We've been throwing away what Jesus has sent to build His church. We've been rejecting what He's accepted. We've been put out and lost our patience with those that He's really taken time with. 
Our presentable parts have no need, but God composed. Everybody say composed. That word also means blended. God has blended the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that those, listen, that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. I used to read that over and over and over again, and I'm thinking, that, that sounds so much out of context. It just it, it didn't make sense. But the Lord finally tapped me on my shoulder and said, if you have the revelation of the city church, that makes a lot of sense. And when I finally saw that on the day of Pentecost, I kept wondering, Lord, the day of Pentecost, what really happened other than the introduction of tongues? We Pentecostals have really got all excited about the tongues, but something else happened on the day of Pentecost. See, before the day of Pentecost, they were already in one accord. So it wasn't that they got in one accord on the day of Pentecost. They were already in one accord in one place. They were in a gathering together. So what happened on the day of Pentecost, I believe this, and you can just search it out, and Pastor Kevin, I, you know, I hope he searches out and corrects me if I'm wrong. But the word that's used there in the King James is cloven tongues came upon them. Are you there? <laughs> but the word for cloven means what? Divided. And I finally saw, saw something that I believe the Lord said. He said, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came with the giftings and the anointings, He divided them up and basically said to us, now trust me to put them back together and blend them and pour them out so that no man or woman is, is, stands out among them, but the body stands out among them. When you get that revelation, there'll be no schism because you'll say, Lord, I don't want any part to be missing that you've sent to put in place. I want to receive the part that you sent. Is that making sense to anybody? It did to me. And you know, sometimes you gotta be careful when it makes sense to you. you maybe it's as wrong as a Dickens. I used to be anointed to preach wrong things. I, <laughs> but I still believe that on the day of Pentecost, that's what happened. The Lord divided up the body as only the Lord could. Now, let, me, let me bring this home to you so you can have something to, to look at. How many of you drink smoothies? This is my smoothie doctrine. As you know, I'm not a real, of course you don't know this, my wife knows this, I'm not a fan of smoothies because she always wants to put spinach in them. <laughs> I don't care what you got in that smoothie, when you put spinach in it, it's tough, it's just bad. <laughs> I have an amen back in the... Back in the <laughs> but the process of, of, of a smoothie is you take various fruits and various things that you want in that thing, especially if you've got spinach, you want to cover up the taste best you can. <laughs> And you cut up bananas, throw them in there, cut up plums, you cut up all the sweet stuff, good stuff, all the antioxidants and all that, you just cut it up. And then you have to put that spinach in there. <laughs> but when you smooth it, what, how does it get smooth? By the two-edged sword. <laughs> that there be no schisms among you. I'm getting ready to And then I'm gonna be able in my city where I'm able to come where the lampstand is still there and pour out the city church and no man can get the glory because you can't tell where he is. Isn't that good? Nobody can say that's mine. So I've seen the smoothie but I don't see you. That's the point, isn't it? That there be no schisms in the body. Lord, convert us so that you can come and... We said years ago when we started our meetings on a weekly basis for the brethren that we continued for 24 years until I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I, I resigned after 24 years this past 70th birthday. Literally, I was telling my wife, I, I was sick and tired. Wasn't sleeping good, wasn't, I was having anxiety attacks, didn't know what they were. I was terrible in shape. And then finally I got some good medicine and now I'm able to sleep a little bit and all of that. But I, I just finally came to the end of my rope with it because I didn't feel like there was a commitment that needed to be there. But it was all that had to do with my 
processing. I wasn't in the best spiritual state. How many know that when you, your physical state can really affect your spiritual? So that's been six months ago. But, uh, but for 24 years, we met every, every week, very, very often. And I, I, I learned a lot sitting at that table because I learned to, li to receive brethren that I didn't like. And listen, we argued like brothers. We'd argued and fight. People come visit our table and were amazed. We'd go to lunch and have lunch together. <laughs> Amen. Uh, let me drop this on you. I'm telling you, the church has taught our society how to get a divorce and be happy. Yeah. I'm not opposed to divorcees. I'm, talking, I'm opposed to divorce. Divorcees are, 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 my mama was a divorcee for all of the rest of my adult life. Married, she married the one time, and it's tough. She was a single mother. Amen? And a single mother's tough, isn't it, Melissa? But we, the church, has taught the church how to divorce. You know why I say that? Because if we don't like you, we get rid of you. If you're not say, doing what we're doing, then we, well, we don't need you. If you don't say it like I say it, forget you. Then we go to the counselor. We're incompatible. Well, I wonder why. It's hard to be compatible when you're shouting at each other and not talking together. Now, why am I saying this? Because that's what we do as brethren. Am I on the right base? And we would talk at the table over the years about the fact that our relationships was really like being married. And it really was. And we still loved each other. There were times we had to straighten some things out. Had to say, I'm sorry, forgive me, I apologize. That's the material that Continuing marriages on. Amen? Well, I, I know I, I've learned, we all know this, the three, three words that my, your wives guys will, must hear. Three, you know the three words? You're right, dear. <laughs> but you know, having said that, Pastor, I, I think, what, as Brother Kevin and I have been talking about this, about the city church, I like what he says about this, and I agree with it totally. For the city church to, survive, to, to thrive, you cannot go down to the lowest common denominator. You've got to lift up the standard. And I'm telling you, when, whenever the Lord grants us the, the revelation of the city church, the standard will be high. And you know why? Because we'll be able to talk about the truth. How many of you know this is the truth? The entirety of the word is truth. And that is the first doctrine that we meet around. If we're not going to meet around that, we don't even need to meet. If we don't believe in the triune God, we don't really need to meet. If we don't believe in the absolute need of men to be born again, to, to make heaven, to spend eternity with God, we don't really, really need to meet. We have no, nothing to meet in. If we're not in agreement about what the work of the Holy Spirit is do, has done and is doing, who is where the unity is, the, by the way, listen, don't, don't rebuke me, but the unity is not in Jesus. The unity is in the Spirit. Now I can say this technically, it's the Spirit of Jesus. But it's the Spirit nonetheless. And I've got a lot of folks that want to talk about loving Jesus and being our unity in Jesus. But if you're not treating your brother like Jesus, then there's no unity whatsoever being promoted. Does anybody know that the body of Christ is Christ? Right. Anyhow, I'd want to go on off on that subject. Yeah, but this, let me see if I've come, I'm not at the end of my notes, but my people know that I never finish, I just stop. <laughs> Turn over to John, John 17 real quickly. My time, I, I, for myself, my time is gone, but I want to close with these things. This is my first closing. John, John 17 Eight. How many of you know what this chapter is? It's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. This really is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer that we repeat is really the disciples' prayer that He taught them to pray. Amen? So this is the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And He said this in verse 8. Let's look at that. I have given to them 
the words which you've given to me, and they've received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. He said, the words that you gave me, I have given to them. That's my job today, and that's pastor's job. The word that he gives, we give to you. And he said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Isn't that interesting? I'm praying for them because they're the light in the world. They're the salt in the earth. They're the church I'm building. There's where the kingdom of God is able to come. There's where the right spirit produces the right results. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. They are yours. You gave them to me because they're yours. I want to submit to you, when you receive the word of the Lord, He'll give you to me. He'll give me to you. And He'll say to us, you are one together. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 said, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. When He gives you to me and me to you, He makes us one spirit. There's the unity where the oneness is and the unity. And Jesus went further on to say in this prayer, He said, Father, I would that they were one. How? That is divine unity. And I'm telling you, when the Lord is able to convert us in the manner that He wants to convert us, we'll be able to come into the spirit of unity that is only found in the Godhead. Fathers never had to turn to Jesus and say, do you agree with me? Holy Spirit has never had to say, Father, I didn't quite get that. That's the kind of oneness we will enjoy forever. But in this life and on this planet and during this church age, God is calling us to hear the word of the Lord that He wants us to be one as they are one. You've been joined to me. I'm your family. And if you have a problem with me, let's talk about the problem. Let's don't leave each other. That's the right spirit. Too big a crowd today to ask for questions. I'm, you might ask too many of your questions. But. <laughs> but I really would like to know if you have questions. If you have questions, I'd like to hear them sometimes. But, but I, I have not been able to get into all the depth of what this thing's about. There's, it's all through the Bible. Over and over again. That was my first closing, I said. <laughs> I heard this word from the Lord this morning. I hadn't heard it like this. Remember when Jesus said... That a man's life, Luke 12, 15, he said, a man's life does not consist in the things he possesses. He said, it doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And I heard the Lord say, his life consists in what possesses him. And I want you to know that Pastor Kevin is a possessed man because he has a word that he carries and seed that he sows. I want you to know that my wife and I are possessed people as well as the birds. And the wonderful thing is we have different seeds. And the glorious thing is we're willing to water each other's seeds. That's what apostles and prophets do. They don't compete, they complete each other. Amen? Amen. So that's my second closing, my third closing. I gotta turn there and find out what that is. What I tell you, I'm going to make certain it's right. Yeah, I've already said that. I did my third closing halfway through the message. Everybody stand up. Except you be converted. You've got to hear the word of the Lord. Except you be converted. You know what I say to the Lord? Convert us, O Lord. Holy Spirit, you've come to convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And we like to say, oh yeah, those bad sinners, those adulterers and those thieves and those murderers. He's talking about your sin and my sin. Convicting us so thoroughly and so completely that we become more and more converted. And if we slide back a little bit, he wants to bring correction and instruction to us. So that we can be further. You know what I call that? Somebody says, are you saved? And I always want to say, how saved are you? Hebrews chapter 7 says he's able to save you to the uttermost.
I want to be saved to the uttermost. And I find my insecurity in knowing that I'm not as saved as I want to be. You know, when you, when you come to the place of that type of insecurity, you find very little ability to point fingers at other people. Does that make any sense to anybody? I believe that's a part of what being of the right spirit is. That's a part of what the Bible says, walk humbly with your God. How many of you know if you don't walk humbly with your God, God can humble you? Right. 28 years ago, I found that to be true. When the Lord starts showing you who you really are, talking about man in the mirror, talking about it's me, it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me. Because I know, I know this about you, Lord. I could pray till the cows come home and they, will, they may, may never be changed, but I know when I pray for myself, you will change me. I have grace for my change, but I can't have grace for your change. You don't understand what I'm saying? I'm, talk, I'm not talking about just loving you. I'm talking about... I can't demand your change. And I Lord, you've got to change them. You've got to change my wife before I, I tell you. You've got to change my husband. I'm telling you, you've got to do that. You've got, you can't expect me to stay in this case. I'm not talking about abusive cases. I'm talking about, you know, sensible. You know what the Lord says? Yes, you can. You can stand in that place by my grace. And I will bring you out. And I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not of. There's a reason the scripture says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I'll be his God. And he shall be my son. Revelation 21, I believe verse 7. As I've always asked the question, if there's an inheriting all things, is there inheriting only of partial things? I want the full inheritance. How about you? Amen. Everybody close your eyes for a moment. Let's pray for a second. <coughs> Father, to the best I knew how this morning, I've come to open my mouth and believe that you have given words that your people can listen to and hear and can receive. And so I believe today that the seed has been sown and it will bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I expect to see in these lives and days to come people being transformed by a confrontation with Jesus when he says, why are you persecuting me? Understanding that, Lord, when we look on each other to, dis to do distractions and treacherous things to each other, we're doing them to Jesus. And so we thank you for the word today. We thank you that you're giving us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. I thank you that you're converting us and we're being changed from glory to glory. And so I commit these precious people to you today as I thank you for the oversight of this pastor and his wife. Thank you for the house. I thank you for the spirit that abides here. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the future. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Everybody said amen.